are going to for for those of you who are out there in uh, San Diego at the American Academy of Pediatric National Meeting. Um, you can join us for a reception at Children's National on Sunday evening, the 12th, at Union Kitchen. You RSVP online at childrensnational.org slash alumni. And I want to remind folks listening in that each December we do our um, annual uh, pediatric practice management seminar, The Business of Pediatrics. This year it's scheduled for Wednesday, December 10th at the Marriott North Bethesda Conference Center. You can register online at childrensnational.org slash BOP14, Business of Pediatrics. Um, and we'll be looking at the Enhanced Medical Home, uh, coding updates for 2015, getting ready for ICD-10, uh, and presentations on what patients want, what do payers want, practice success stories, uh, do patients want a medical home, do patients want convenience care, we'll tell you how to be successful at both. Um, so that's going to be Wednesday, December 10th at the Marriott North Bethesda. There's free registration for uh, you at childrensnational.org slash BOP14. So with those announcements, uh, we'll move forward to today's topic, which will be focused on uh, emerging viruses. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, um, we think the lines will be muted. Uh, please try to keep background noise at a minimum. Um, and please uh, chat questions into the chat box in the lower right, and we will try to get to them over the course of the presentation. So with that, uh, we're just going to pause for a second uh, while I um, transfer the presentation to Dr. DiBiase. So, Roberta, you should have the ball momentarily. I think I have it. Great. So welcome, everybody. Um, can everyone hear me okay, I hope? Um, we're going to talk today about two viruses that are in the news, and I'm sure you've been hearing about and getting questions from your patients, because we certainly have been getting them at the hospital. And these are, of course, Ebola virus, which I have a beautiful picture of right here, and then uh, Enrovirus 68. And it's interesting, when I was uh, being asked to be giving update lectures on Ebola, uh, kind of right in the middle of that, we then got bombarded with Enrovirus 68 at the same time. So I want to give you some simple information Your line has been muted. So that you're ready to unmute your, your line, press star 6 so or pound 6, and you will um, hear a slight Ebola tone when unmuted. fever, and there are actually many different types of viruses that are in this kind of umbrella term of viral hemorrhagic fevers. It's severe, often fatal disease in humans and non-human primates, such as monkeys, gorillas, chimpanzees. And before this first, uh, before this current outbreak, which is now occurring for the first time in West Africa, um, we used to see outbreaks uh, intermittently in Congo mostly, and the the fatality rate was up to 90 percent. Current epidemic we're having now, it's more around 50 percent. So there are some slight differences, but either way you slice it, that's a very um, disease. So it's uh, hem Ebola hemorrhagic fever is caused by infection with specific virus called Ebola virus within the family filovirus. And it turns out this was first discovered in 1976. Uh, and ever since then, it comes and goes, and you may or may not hear about it, depending on how much the media is interested, because the pr prior outbreaks in Congo have been much smaller. So let's review, you know, where is Ebola? Why does it do this periodic emergence? It's, uh, there's an enzootic circle, mean, cycle, meaning that it's maintained in nature within animals. And then there's an epizootic cycle where it can then get out of its usual circulation and then uh, accidentally into humans. So there's a lot of evidence that really implicates bats are the reservoir host for Ebola viruses. We don't really completely understand how it's maintained. Uh, and as you can see, there's five or six different Ebola viruses that circulate in the enzootic cycle. But eventually, um, these epizootics are caused by Ebola viruses um, getting into non-human primates. 
and then into us. And usually the, the reason that these have emerged traditionally in Africa are there are practices around bushmeat and um, eating these animals that can then lead to the transmission to humans if it happens to be out of the bat into the non-human primate. So for the current West African outbreak, this is the largest outbreak in history. It's the first in West Africa whatsoever. And the current outbreak, and this is important, um, it's not all of Africa, and we want to be clear that we don't want to be panicking. Uh, you know, every single person that returns from Africa is not at risk for Ebola, um, and it's really important to know where the current outbreak is occurring. CDC updates this every single week at a minimum and sometimes even daily if there's a new country. But really the countries haven't changed in the last month, and that is Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, a very small, isolated part of Nigeria, and we'll talk about where and why that was, and one single case in Senegal, which actually originated from one of these other countries and walked in, but there's been no further transmission within Senegal. The CDC has been very clear that this, this outbreak does not pose a significant risk to the United States, but of course the media doesn't like that message, so you're seeing it every day as it's a major risk to everyone, and that's why your patients and you, of course, are appropriately concerned. So we'll try to go through the reality of this. There have been a small number of cases, as I mentioned, Nigeria in Lagos and Port Harcourt. And these were all uh, associated with a Liberian man. So these three countries are really the heart of the outbreak. A man from Liberia who was ill traveled to Lagos and died there. And unfortunately, uh, the outbreak was propagated usually um, within healthcare workers at the hospital where this person was taken care of. Uh, but it really has not spread beyond that original area in Nigeria. The, and I already mentioned one case in Senegal is related to a man who traveled there from Guinea as well. So for those of you who don't uh, know the whole geography of Africa, it's a very, 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 very large country. And the area we're talking about is here in West Africa in the little black square. And if you then blow this up, um, this is the region that we're talking about. So Liberia, Guinea, uh, Sierra Leone, they're all you know, contiguous borders. Um, you can see that Senegal would be easy to walk from Guinea to Senegal, um, and likewise for Nigeria. Um, and as opposed to that, the, the historically where we've had Ebola is in this region in the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. So these case counts were actually from a week ago when I gave another uh, lecture, but the point is the same, that we have thousands and thousands of cases, about a 50% mortality. Um, not all these have been lab confirmed, but they will be. Um, and then the bulk of the cases are coming from the Guinea, uh, Liberia, um, and um, uh, Sierra Leone, with the bulk of the cases from Liberia. So this is really the country where um, the CDC is putting most of their efforts, and you've been reading in the news about it, sending out help for these countries. And opposed to that, Nigeria, it was very limited to the healthcare worker outbreak, but that one case in Senegal really was only the, the man who actually walked over, so no one uh, secondary cases in Senegal. So I wanted to just show you some of the barriers to, you know, why it's difficult to control out in the field um, and some of the signs and signage that the CDC has been trying to help with. So, you know, they're very resource poor settings. Um, there are not a lot of facilities to isolate people. There's a lot of um, local suspicion amongst the people who live there uh, with regard to people from the West coming in and helping. And you can imagine um, it's worse than if it had occurred in Congo where they're actually familiar with uh, Ebola. So when Ebola emerges in Congo, people are familiar with it and they understand that this is something that exists in nature. In West Africa, they've never seen this, and then if all of a sudden we have people in, you know, white spacesuits coming in to supposedly help, you can imagine how you might think the two are linked and that actually those people are bringing the disease. So that has been a barrier to limiting the spread. Uh, but these are the kind of signs that are being put up in the various villages in the big countries that are involved. So if you have fever, diarrhea, vomiting, with or without bleeding, go immediately to your nearest healthcare facility, and there's uh, visuals to show that. This is an example of the um, settings that they have in these small villages. There's a man who's very ill getting IV fluids um, and people in their pr pr uh, protective equipment, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and there's 
very important is the signage for the healthcare workers themselves, because you can imagine if you're seeing hundreds and hundreds of cases, you might start to get immune to the fact that you really do need to maintain 100% of DP disease. Another big barrier I think you've been hearing about is the uh, burial practices in these countries involve a lot of direct contact with the dead body, including people at the funerals um, touching the body, et cetera, and that uh, unfortunately is the way that this is being propagated. So there's been a big push to get uh, community members be designated as sort of um, uh, points for their village so that they are then trained appropriately in how to remove the body and prevent further transmission within a village. So to contrast all of that with um, the or uh, with the West African one, which you've been hearing about, you may or may not have heard that about I don't know almost a month ago now, started getting cases in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which have been the traditional place where these emerge. And of course, the immediate question was, are these the same Ebola strains? The bottom line is, um, you know, they've done a pretty good um, evaluation of 24 cases and 80 contacts and looked at it genetically, and it turns out there really is no relationship of the Ebola strain going on in West Africa, the big one, and this um, smaller blip in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So currently the CDC is not um, including on all the screening questionnaires questions about travel to Congo. Um, Let's see here. Uh, yeah, so this just reiterates that, you know, the CDC has been very clear and as of September 6th really has stressed that um, it's best not to travel to the specific countries that I've mentioned, uh, but that you should not necessarily restrict travel to Africa, nor should you necessarily indi uh, indicate or uh, uh, instigate any Ebola precautions for people to uh, countries other than with contact to those places. And in fact, it's the healthcare providers caring for Ebola patients and their close family and friend that are at the highest risk. So we at Children's um, have spent a lot of time and effort across the institution. I'm gonna give you a snapshot of what we've come up with and then of course it's gonna be tailored to you and your offices. And I wanna be clear about what you can do in your office versus what it is we're doing in, at, the, at the Children's Medical Center. And then furthermore, if you have a case, how can you get in touch with us and, um, and what will we be doing? Um, so the first slide here, it's small, but I, the point is that we have a screening form that we've developed across our clinics, our emergency room for our transport service, and you can, you're welcome to adapt this for your use. Um, essentially, we keep track triage area, the, um, the following questions. Does the patient have symptoms of unexplained fever greater than 38.6? muscle pain, vomiting, unexplained bleeding, severe headache, diarrhea, or abdominal pain. Now you can imagine there's a lot of patients that come into your into our ED and in fact in your office with these kind of questions. So you may also, uh, you then need to narrow it down to yes to one or more of the following. Within 21 days, and that's key, that's the, that's the incubation period, before the onset of those symptoms that we just talked about, has the patient or some patient has been in close contact with traveled to, and it's limited to these four places, Guinea, Lagos, Nigeria, Liberia, or Sierra Leone. If the answer to that question is no, then we stop. If the answer is yes, then we ask that you call the operator and we have one pager uh, that's 24 seven, someone will answer the phone. If you're not sure, you're, you have any questions or concerns whatsoever, we can walk you through this questionnaire and we have a more detailed questionnaire as well. And we're happy to help you with that. The most important thing that you need to know is if you have any concern, you simply put that patient in a room, uh, a dedicated room with a closed door, and I'm gonna tell you about the personal protective equipment you utilize with the patient. So our outbreak um, communication algorithm is we would receive the call from you. Um, we're the one-stop spot, so you don't have to worry about 29 different numbers to remember. And then we will take control of escalating it to infection control, hospital administrator, the DC Department of Health, and our lab. And we kind of all have a team, we, we all know what to expect, and we've actually been through this drill many times now, um, so we're prepared to help you. This just, I don't want you expect you to read all this, this just makes a point that we have um, across the institution a plan from every aspect of the hospital on how to handle these patients safely. 
So we have isolation precautions, which I'm going to show you in a readable form in a moment. We have a reminder about hand hygiene. We talk about every person who sees the patient needs to be um, listed on a log and monitored. Make sure they're using personal protective equipment that there are specific ways that lab specimens need to be handled and that aerosol generating procedures should be um, avoided. And we can do that at the hospital, but you shouldn't be doing that in your We have transport uh, recommendations and our transport team knows exactly what to activate if they're going to transport someone from your office to us. Um, we have environmental services and specific practices and our waste management plan has also been updated. So we're fully ready to accept these patients. So for you, the important thing is immediately, as soon as you get a yes to those questions on the initial screen, you simply need to immediately place the patient in a single room with a closed door. And I'll talk to you about what you as the physician are going to put on, but really this is it. Um, now for us, you may have heard in the ED, once they're transferred to us, we are actually opting to escalate to airborne. And the reason for that is not because we think we need more protection than you. The reason is that uh, the CDC recommends that if an aerosolizing procedure is going to be performed, that you need to be in negative pressure, and we want to be ready to do that. We didn't think it was very practical to put patients in one sort of room, and then if they decompensated, then have to move them to another room and expose other patients. So we are putting them in airborne initially, but you do not need to do that in your office. If you happen to have an airborne room and you want to use it, that's fine but I want to be clear that you're not exposing yourself by using a regular room with a closed door. The personal protective equipment I'm going to spend a couple slides on because this is the most important thing in preventing uh, transmission of Ebola, and it's really been the limitation in the resource poor settings, but we have no reason we can't comply with these measures here in the U.S. So there are, um, after this slide, which is a general slide, I'm going to walk you through a cartoon of exactly how to put on and take off the uh, protective equipment. It's very important to do it in the right order and the right way so that you don't contaminate yourself. Um, so donning, um, we are using N95 in an airborne room at the hospital, but as I said, in your uh, location, if you are not using an airborne room or you don't have N95, a standard surgical mask is what the CDC recommends for the first line for the clinics. Gloves, shoe covers if you have them. Uh, we are using coverall suits, which are um, kind of white, um, kind of a jumpsuit, but the CDC recommends in your clinics a, just a basic moisture-resistant gown. If you have these yellow um, sort of plastic-lined gowns, that is fine. Um, and then you want to have some sort of a coverage over your mucous membrane, so if you have goggles, that's what we're using. If you don't, plain masks with a face shield are also suitable. And um, our outpatient clinics at Children's at Seca Zod have actually come up with little kits, so they kind of have everything ready. It's labeled Ebola kit so that everyone's not scrambling to find things if you don't have these at ready access in your clinic. If any of you are interested in assembling one of these, we're happy to assist you with that. Um, and you, you're welcome to contact me or Dr. Song in infection control. Um, taking off, as I said, the most important thing is you have to remember that the, 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 um, the, the clothing that you have on above here, the external parts of that are potentially contaminated and you don't want to contaminate your own mucous membranes or eyes when you're taking them off. So we'll walk through how to do that safely. So this is a nice slide and if you would like you know, even more detailed information, there are videos on the CDC that show someone doing this. When I give the talk at um, Che Kazad, I actually have someone do it in front of everybody so they can watch, um, but we didn't have that capability today. Um, but you can do that yourself online if you'd like. Um, but essentially the first thing you're going to put on is your gown. So this is your standard uh, barrier gown. You're going to fasten it in the back and don't be lazy, go ahead and tie it in the waist and the neck. You're next going to put on your mask, and this is a standard mask um, which um, may have the attached plastic face shield, which I think they're showing in this next slide, or if it doesn't, you may have goggles to put on. Um, you want to um, secure them both at the top and the bottom, and you want to then squeeze the nose so that you are um, creating you know, somewhat of a barrier. But to, to reiterate, Ebola is not an airborne disease unless you're doing a uh, aerosolizing procedure. Um, and then the last thing you're going to put on is your gloves, and you want these to cover the wrist of the isolation gown so that you have a nice barrier. You don't have your skin um, sticking out between the gown and the gloves. 
When you take off the personal protective gear, you're going to start with your gloves. Um, and remember, of course, I mean, this sounds silly, but when you get in a stressful situation, sometimes people forget these things. So outside of a glove is contaminated. You want to therefore grasp the outside with your opposite gloved hand and uh, kind of slide them off and peel it off, as they're showing in the picture here. And then you're holding it by the inside and discard that directly into your designated waste container. Um, and then you're going to then remove your goggles or face shield. That's your next step. Next is the gown. So you're going to unfasten the ties and kind of roll it away from you, if you can see this person doing that, because the inside is clean, the outside is dirty. And then uh, put it in a bundle and stick it in the designated area. And then this is the last part, the mask. Um, the front is contaminated, so you don't want to touch the front. You want to grab it from behind, pull it off, and then stick it into the bin. So that's a good example of the donning and doffing. And really, if you do that properly every time, you are going to be very protected from Ebola. Um, it does not transmit from walking past a patient in a waiting room. Um, you know, theoretically, if you shook someone's hand who had just vomited on their hand, it could. But you know, for the most part, it really takes significant contact with body fluids for transmission. The other thing that's important in your office is to have a log um, so that when um, we know finally the status of the patient, let's say it turns out it really is an Ebola disease patient, you need to be able to track everyone who had contact with that patient. So this is the log that we post immediately um, in the room of the patient once they're at Children's, and we list the time they're in, out, whether or not they had their uh, PPE on, and the, of course they have to have the PPE on, uh, but you know we, we can go back and then double check and make sure all these things were done um, in, in um, in retrospect. So these are some more um, other breaker slides just to show you that the CDC is really putting a lot of effort now into very simple signage. Um, we don't recommend that you do this in your offices because we think it raises the concern level to a higher level than it needs to be at this point. Certainly the CDC will guide us if they think we should start posting in clinics. Um, but these are the sort of things that they're trying to tell people. You know, it can only be spread after symptoms begin, which is quite a blessing. If you recall, when I've talked to you about influenza, you can be very um, uh, contagious to people even before you have symptoms in the case of influenza. But that is not the case in Ebola. It's really until you have symptoms um, that it's only until you have symptoms that you can then infect other people. And the incubation we've already talked about is 21 days. So um, once it gets to us, we consider these folks, if they meet the screening questions uh, that we, I showed you on the, on the earlier slide, um, we call them a person under investigation. This is CDC terminology. And then we'll go through again and take much more detailed information. The first questions are very similar to what I just told you about. Um, but then we'll ask them some more specific questions about, well, if you were in Sierra Leone, did you actually touch someone else's blood or body fluids? Were you involved in a funeral? Um, did you have direct handling of bats or non-human primates? We'll ask these higher level questions. You don't need to worry about that. Um, and, and then we'll put them into what's termed high risk, low risk, and no known exposure risk categories. And then we will determine what to do um, with regard to further testing or not based on the answers to some of those questions. If you're interested, you know, in these higher level questions, I have them here for you. I don't really think it's important for you in the office setting to get into this level of detail because you have us as a resource, and that's really what we're here for. Um, but just so you know, high risk exposures are really, you know, obvious high risk. Needle sticks, direct contact, processing, so lab workers who actually have handled, um, unbeknownst to them, blood that uh, contained Ebola or direct contact with a, a corpse. Um, lower risk are household contacts, um, which is defined, or close contacts defined as three feet of a patient or within a room for a prolonged period while not wearing personal protective equipment. Um, and specifically, direct brief contact with an EVD case while not wearing uh, PPE can be considered an exposure, but is a low, a low risk exposure. So most of ours that we've been handling so far have been in this no known exposure category where essentially the answer to the question of have you been in that country is yes, but they have not had these specific contacts. Um, and so far, um, we have not had a, des a, um, a definite Ebola case at Children's. 
So other things, key logistics, which we take care of at Children's, but you may want to think about in your own um, offices, depending on where you are and how long it is before, you, you know, that you can get patients to us. We have a laboratory plan. We have a respiratory care plan. We have a transport plan, environmental services plan. We have already thought out very carefully where we will uh, admit a patient into the ER. So we have a special room um, that is away from everyone else. It has very close access to a specific elevator, which you know does not allow us to have to put them throughout the hospital. So if you're in a larger clinic setting, you might want to think about, you know, if at your triage you have someone who's potentially at risk, you want to have ahead of time decide, you know, where would you have a room that you might use. Um, we have a, a public relations plan because, of course, we want to be able to communicate clearly with other people in the hospital as well as the community. A family support plan, because you can imagine this is very um, upsetting to the family to be told you're not going to be isolated to this extent. Um, and then we also have a plan where we um, educate our healthcare workers about ahead of time, if you're going to travel, um, we need to know where you're going so that when you come back, we can screen you appropriately. Um, this really doesn't apply to you. This is a, just an example of very carefully thought out transport plans for patients um, moving them through the hospital. So this, I think, is worth um, talking about because, you know, we're all focused on the patients walking into our office, but many of us do international travel, and I'm sure your offices are no different. So you really do need to have a policy in place um, in your office or in your managerial plan, and ours is such that we require employees who are traveling abroad before they go just to notify their manager where they're going, and then the manager's duty is to forward that to occupational health. When they come back, we, um, they have a list of those that need follow-up, and before they can go back into the clinic and see patients, um, they basically just need to check in with occupational health, and this is for if occupational health is deemed in a country where there's any kind of outbreak. So right now, the ones that we're most focused on are, for instance, um, the Saudi Peninsula because of Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus Syndrome, obviously the West African area because of Ebola, um, but there are other instances and other things that can be transmitted. Um, and so it's good to be kind of on top of this ahead of time, just knowing where folks are going so that we don't accidentally expose other people in the office or patients to um, diseases unbeknownst to us. So, you know, in our plan, they, they check in with occupational health. If they're at one of those high-risk countries, they have a quick screen, and then we decide they can go back to work or not so that we're not um, causing any, we don't want any surprises, in other words. So as far as treatment and prevention of uh, Ebola, the, H, the Health and Human Services has contracted with MAP Biopharmaceuticals, and I'm sure you've heard about ZMAP. Um, this is a combination of three different monoclonal antibodies that bind to the protein of Ebola virus. So it's basically an IVIG product. Um, they are manufacturing small amounts of the drug for early stage clinical safety studies and non-clinical studies. But you already heard that they, in an emergency situation, did use this on the two um, American workers who were brought back to Atlanta CDC. Both of those patients did get better, but I have to tell you that, you know, this has been used on other patients who did not get better, and, in, you know, in my opinion, that I don't think this is what made them better. I think it may have helped, but I think they actually were over the hump of their disease before they received it. Um, needless to say, though, there's great interest in this since we have basically no treatments currently that have gone through the pipeline. So NIH started initial human testing um, additionally of an investigational vaccine in normal healthy volunteers that just started earlier this month. NIH is working with a company to develop antivir an antiviral drug specifically to treat Ebola. And then the U.S. Department of Defense has funded two companies that are developing other drug therapies for Ebola. So there's a lot of money um, and energy into really getting on top of this um, as quickly as we can. So this is a nice infographic showing sort of what CDC is doing. They are um, helping with testing samples of suspected cases around the world. They're putting people out uh, on, in the field to interview people who may have been in contact with Ebola patients before they get sick. They're communicating um, health messages in West Africa and working with the local healthcare providers there. They're educating healthcare workers like you uh, via infectious disease people like me in the United States and in West Africa. There are travel advisories that let people know where it's safe to travel and where they should avoid. Um, there are lots of uh, uh, things in place to train officials in West Africa to prevent sick travelers from getting on and off of planes. 
And um, I think I may have mentioned to this, I may, may or may not have mentioned this to you, but when we were in the kind of crux of the MERS outbreak several months ago, which kind of was at a height in April and May of this year, um, I was really impressed by the CDC um, Global Migration Office. I didn't really know how quickly they are ready to respond, but we had a situation where we had a patient, uh, knowledge that a patient's family might be coming on a plane coming from the area to Children's or to D.C., and, you know, we felt there was a duty, of course, for us to let someone know, but we didn't know exactly how to do it. And basically it was one phone to the, one phone call to CDC, and within five minutes we had people um, on the alert at all three airports or four airports in D.C. To, that knew exactly what to do and what questions to do to intercept those folks. So this is really a, a great system. And then uh, CDC is working with at every port of entry to identify travelers to find um, people with early stages of illness. So the U.S. population is at very low risk, um, but, but we want you as healthcare providers to know this so that you can communicate this and settle people down who are very upset about this and coming into your office. This is an infographic. There's actually more now, but this was about a week ago. They, they sent a bunch of people over uh, the EIS officers directly into the countries um, to deploy them. And there, as I'm sure you've seen in the Washington Post, I don't think I have a slide. Um, the military also now has a presence. They're using Senegal as a kind of a base to get everyone um, into the areas that, uh, to be trained and uh, deployed, and then they're deploying from Senegal into the areas that need the, the most help. Um, and these are just, a, this is just another infographic uh, for the folks in West Africa. Um, but for prevention, it's really infection control, trying to in, intercept these unsafe burial practices and reminding people not to eat bush meat who are in those regions. Um, you can't get Ebola through the air, you can't get it through the water, you can't get it through food. It's a very simple message trying to help people understand that. So that's all I was going to say about Ebola, and we'll save all the questions, I think, to the end. Um, I really have much fewer slides on Intervar 68 because it's a story. story, um, but um, let's go ahead and talk about Intervar 68 here. Um, We've all heard and are very experienced with enteroviruses, and I think the biggest take-home point you should take from this is enterovirus 68 is just one of over 100 enteroviruses. So as opposed to what you have probably seen in the media, um, it's not a scary, unknown, we've never heard of, mysterious, you know, there's all sorts of adjectives that have been attached to enterovirus 68, but really it's one of 100 enteroviruses that we know circulate every year year in, year out, in the late summer and the early fall. So it's not surprising that we have an enterovirus circulating at high levels now, because this is when it always circulates at high levels. What's just a little different is this particular one has not circulated widely in over 40 years, although we have had outbreaks of enterovirus 68 as recently as 2010 and 11, small clusters of disease. So I think that's the most important message um, you can con convey to your, your, your uh, families. So just as a review, when we say enterovirus, that is not one virus. That is an umbrella term that we use to encompass uh, three main families of viruses, Coxsackie viruses, which are further broken down into A and B in numbers and letters. There's echoviruses, and then there are enteroviruses that are just given a number, such as enterovirus 68. Um, and the enteroviruses cause all these syndromes that you see often in your office, so hand, foot, and mouth disease, which here's a nice picture of someone with classic hand, foot, and mouth disease lesions on their palms and soles. The common cold, it's the number one cause of the common cold. Diarrhea, herpangina, which is the you know, ulcerative uh, hemorrhagic lesions on the soft palate that cause sore throat and pharyngitis. Aseptic meningitis, which I have to tell you, I had it last week. I had an entire week of, I finally experienced aseptic meningitis, and it's not fun. I'm fine today. Um, and encephalitis and myocarditis, if there's more invasive disease, which is very rare. Most of the time, it's the common cold this time of year. So enterovirus 68, um, it, ha it is thought to occur less commonly than some of those other Coxsackie, Echo, and other numbered enteroviruses. It was first identified in California in 1962. Uh, and, but like I said, if you go into the MMWR um, free publication from CDC, it's fully accessible on their website, you can pull up a nice report as recently as 2010 and 11 that it was circulating in the United States. Um, so 
I think it's really important to know the facts so that you're not overly escalating people's concerns about the virus. But let's talk about why was there such a hubbub over this. Um, and in fact, there was uh, the place where the outbreak was first noted was in two hospitals. One was Kansas City, Missouri. The other was uh, Chicago Comer's Children's Hospital. And in Kansas City, Missouri, in uh, August 5th through 19th, they the clinicians felt that there was an increase in patients with severe respiratory illness. So as opposed to the every you know late summer fall kind of blip in uh, patients with common cold and maybe some mild asthma exacerbations, there were more patients being admitted to their intensive care unit with respiratory illness. And this, of course, is sooner than we would have expected for flu. Um, so they were monitoring their respiratory viral um, testing, and they noticed that they were increased in their rhinovirus enterovirus, which is usually bundled together, and I'll talk to you about that in a moment, uh, positive. So they contacted their local health department, which is the blip that we're wondering about, um, and the CDC decided to go out and investigate, and they, they found this particular enterovirus 68 in 19 of the 22 specimens that were uh, tested. It was about half and half male, female. The average range of age was six weeks to 16 years of age with a median of four years of age. Two-thirds of these patients had a prior history of wheezing or asthma, but one-third had no prior history of asthma or wheezing. All of these patients had shortness of breath and hypoxemia, so significant illness, um, and 21% had wheezing. Only one-quarter of these patients had fever, so most of these patients, despite being relatively ill, uh, only a quarter of them had a fever, and all of these were admitted to the PICU, four of which required BiPAP, um, not intubation. Chest X-rays um, really looked like a perihilar infiltrate, nothing low bar, and blood cultures and other evaluation for bacterial co-infection were essentially negative. So as opposed to flu, where a lot of times the patients that get into trouble and get into the ICU have co-infection with either pneumococcus or staph, these patients seem to be getting into the ICU even without the co-infection. So something about enterovirus 68 itself um, causing significant symptoms. All of these patients got better and were discharged. Um, University of Chicago, um, they had a similar experience. Theirs was a little bit later, August 23rd. They had 14 specimens, of which 11 tested positive for 68. They had a slight female predominance and very similar age range, maybe perhaps a little bit older because they didn't have a young uh, patient. Um, again, they saw the same pattern, two-thirds with the prior history of asthma or wheezing, one, uh, about one, sorry, three-quarters with asthma or wheezing, one-quarter um, that did not. Again, very few febrile patients. Most of them did get end up in the PICU. Two of their 11 actually required mechanical ventilation, and one actually needed ECMO. Um, but the majority of these patients, uh, again, needed lower levels of support, and they all also got better. So since then, um, there have been other states sending their enterovirus samples for testing to the CDC. And these are, as of today, uh, on the CDC website. They have 153, 153 laboratory-confirmed cases in 18 states, which you can see here. But I guarantee you that if we all sent our enteroviruses in for um, typing, you know, the map would be much more extensive. And, you know, should you send it in for typing, we elected not to initially because it's really an enterovirus like any other. There's no change in the treatment or anything else. The D.C. Department of Health, and you can check your local health department if they have different um, recommendations. Our health department really only wants to know about critically ill individuals. They're keeping track of those and are doing testing on those cases. So for all enteroviruses, and, and enterovirus 68 is really no different, um, there's no specific treatment. These will be mild and self-limited illnesses, or in the case of 68, maybe a little less mild, but still self-limited, requiring treatment of symptoms and support through the worst of it. Um, there are no antiviral medications currently available for treating enterovirus 68 or any enteroviruses. Um, for those of you that are interested, if, there, if you do have a severe enteroviral infection, such as enteroviral um, sepsis of the newborn, or enteroviral myocarditis or encephalitis, we do have access at Children's to compassionate release medications um, that have activity against enterovirus, and we have used these. So we're very happy to help you if you have a very ill patient um, to help you access those through the FDA. 
Um, but for the run-of-the-mill antivirus, there is no antiviral therapy. And the prevention is, as we always say, wash your hands, sneeze properly. The only, for, the only difference for antivirus 68 compared to regular antivirus uh, is that usually antivirus is only contact isolation, meaning um, gown and gloves. But for Enervirus 68, as an added precaution, the CDC has recommended adding droplets, so adding the mask, uh, because this particular Enervirus has a little bit, it seems, based on the disease it's causing, a little bit of um, similarity with rhinovirus uh, in addition to Enervirus. And, and you may know or may not know that rhinoviruses are very similar genetically to Enerviruses, but this particular Enervirus also kind of acts clinically more like a rhinovirus. So contact and droplet are, are what you should be using when you see these patients. And this is, again, a very nice infographic uh, that the CDC put out, um, keeping your child from getting and spreading enterovirus. So avoid close contact with sick people. Cover your coughs, cough into your elbow. Uh, wash your hands often. Avoid touching your face with unwashed hands. Clean and disinfect surfaces. Stay home when you're sick. This is something you could put in your office or have as a handout or a flyer um, if there's you know, a lot of attention, um, as there has been uh, with the media, people coming in and asking you about it. So that's all I was going to say about Intervirus 68, and I think um, at this point we can open up the question uh, the line to questions. Um, and I think I have to rely on Mark to do that. Mark, are you still there? Yep, I'm going to try to unmute line. So, um, folks, please... Uh, try to manage your background noise, and we'll see what happens. Worst case, I can always put the put back the cone of silence. <laughs> so, are there any um, questions from our listeners out there? Great. So, I have a question. This is Ruth. We always struggle a little with um, the stay home when you're sick recommendation, right? Like if a child just has cold symptoms, you know, we're often going to be sending those children back to school. We can't tell everyone with a cold to stay home from school. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, if, you, if they have a fever, they have to stay home. But as, as I already mentioned, most of these kids aren't going to have a fever. Um, and the reality is we're hearing about the most severe cases. Do we really believe that, you know, everyone who gets intervirus 68 is ending up in the PICU? No. I mean, there's a huge proportion of people, the big part of the iceberg, who just have respiratory symptoms. So there is no difference in what we're telling people now as opposed to any other time. It's right. Because with running those, no, no other symptoms are going to go back to school That's the way it is. But you can teach them to cough in their elbow and wash their hands a lot. You, you know, hopefully it's good to everybody. Roberta, it's Muriel Wolf. Should we all be wearing masks all the time? <laughs> I guess it depends on your clinic setting. You know, um, you know, a lot of that, uh, maybe we could have one of the outpatient folks chime in. You know, how, what percentage of the people coming in to see you are coming in with respiratory symptoms? If it's a lot, yeah. maybe you should just have a mask on for anyone coming in with a respiratory system mm -hmm. just to be safe. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids do come in with respiratory symptoms. Right. Yeah. That's the situation. So if we see, you know, under patients during the day, no, from the right to you. I can't tell if that was a question. I couldn't hear it. If it was, go ahead and speak a little louder. I think it was just background noise. I have a question. Hello. Hello, I have a question. Can you hear me? Hello? I can barely hear you, but go ahead. Okay, we're we're out in Cumberland, Maryland. I have two cases of uh, a respiratory illness with hypoxia in the hospital now. My question is this basically kind of looking like an RSV for big kids? Is that, that what the uh, clinical uh, pictures? I think what you said was you have a couple of patients in the hospital right now requiring support but not in the ICU, and should we think of uh, Intervar 68 as an RSV for older kids? 
Um, and the answer is, yeah, I, I think that's actually a great, um, although it can affect, as you saw, all the way down to the six weeks of age, but you're right, that it's, it can be in older kids. It seems right now that it's not affecting as much older, like, um, you know, older adolescents and adults, or at least they're not getting severe enough disease that we're picking up a signal there. But you're right. You should think of it as um, a child that's getting a, a wheezing um, or asthma exacerbation, but can also be significantly hypoxemic, but generally does not have fever. Right. So thanks. I, I did send one sample set. I'm guessing Maryland will be turning green soon. <laughs> Your okay. And Roberta, your experience is, is that fortunately most of these kids seem to be doing pretty well with and recovering in a relatively yeah. short time frame with supportive therapy. Yeah, our PICU colleagues um, have told us that almost all of these kids are turning around really quickly, like within a day or, you know, not even a, a day and getting discharged out to the rest of the regular hospital ward. So while it's, you know, technically true they're requiring critical care, they're not ending up intubated or remaining in the PICU for prolonged periods. So hopefully that will be the case with your uh, kids out in Cumberland. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Thanks. Uh, are there any other questions from our audience? Thank you. Great. Well, I want to I want to thank Dr. DiBiase for um, really sort of distilling down uh, from a lot of the media noise, sort of the news we can use uh, as frontline pediatricians for both um, just getting some perspective on Ebola and what our practices might need to do. So it might be useful to look at those CDC infographics and just make sure that even though hopefully you will never need them, just sort of having some, you know, uh, prepared kit of gowns and shoe covers and masks and all that kind of stuff ready in case your practice should ever need them. And uh, for putting some perspective on uh, this year's version of enterovirus. So we've been recording this mm -hmm. session. Uh, we will post it on um, the Children's National website by next week. So if any of your colleagues want to watch this, you can point them to that. And uh, Roberta, I want to thank you for a great presentation. Oh, you're welcome. And please, any of you, don't hesitate to just call us. We're, we've been answering lots of calls. We're getting pretty good at it. And we definitely have a plan so that you don't need to, you know, be laying awake at night like, gee, I wonder if I should do this or that. We can tell you exactly, you know, based on the information we have what to do. Great. All right, folks. And I posted the information for CME credit. So you can go online or you can email Danita at dpicket at childrensnational.org, and we can get you the um, CME information. We'll send it out by email as well next week. Thank so, you very much. Thanks for participating. Good day, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.